IT people are uh, <laughs> registered for today's webinar. So thanks to all of you to be here, to be part of this uh, Proud to Share Week uh, that it's organized by Leder and Julie Karian Alps by Sphere Reserve. And welcome to this uh, third webinar organized uh, um, on the theme of outdoor as an experience uh, and as an initiative to uh, push sustainability. Uh, an entire week of uh, study visits, panels, discussion and webinars on uh, outdoor disciplines uh, and, and on how they are related to four themes, climate change, accessibility, discovering the territory and carry capacity. Uh, in today's webinars, uh, we will see how outdoor disciplines can be a tool for discovering and learning about an area, about its history, about nature, culture, through the best practice of some biosphere reserve. So thank you, Thomas Berry. Thank you, Mark Font. And thank you, Urshka Dalinar, to be with us today. And most of all, thanks uh, to Philippe Piper, Program Specialist uh, of the Division of Ecological and Earth Earth science uh, set on in Paris in this moment to be here and to help us in moderating uh, this discussion. Uh, just some uh, uh, technical uh, information. Uh, it's possible to um, follow this uh, discussion in uh, original uh, language, so in English, or to uh, follow it in Italian. You can have you can share and you can uh, um, choose uh, which language you want to follow this uh, discussion on interpretation button you can find below on your screen. Uh, after the three presentation of the best practice the three Biosphere Reserve developed, uh, it will be possible to interact with our uh, uh, host and uh, um, it's possible to pose them uh, reflection, question and uh, um, go deeper in the themes they introduce. It's possible to do it with the chat button on answer, answer and question uh, button or raising the hand. Then I can open your microphone and uh, uh, make you uh, speak directly. So uh, sorry for this uh, uh, brief uh, uh, but technical and using uh, um, information. And I suddenly give the floor to Philippe Piper that uh, help us in going deeper these uh, interesting themes. I'll be here for every technical problem that could be in this webinar. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, Anna. I have immediately a technical question before starting. So uh, how long should the presentation be for each of the presenters? Uh, we thought uh, uh, up to 10 minutes, uh, maybe we can help them in uh, keeping the time, uh, but uh, uh, we can also go deeper the, the themes they introduce in the question and answer moment. <laughs> Last yes, thing, sure. uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded. So for the ones that are not uh, in the condition to be present today, there will be the possibility of uh, uh, listen to it uh, uh, one more time uh, throughout the site of the Biosphere Reserve. Okay, thank you so much. I will therefore do my best to make an introduction shorter than 10 minutes. <laughs> it's not a presentation, but uh, thank you very much for this invitation and congratulations for organizing this very interesting and inspiring uh, series of webinars and this one in particular and for the excellent speaker you have called on board on board and um, it would be my pleasure to, to moderate uh, the presentation and our uh, discussion afterward. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful to um, Oscar, to Mark and to Thomas for joining us and making the presentation. Um, we will talk about these other activities and as we have agreed and, and, and our interest is to explore how then outdoor activity can be seen as a kind of entry point to something more, to experience for those who, who are uh, coming into a vice reserve and their territories to, to experience those outdoor activities. So this something more can be a different level and I hope we could have in, um, a discussion about that afterward, after the, the, the presentation. So it's not just about discovering a territory, nature, but also culture, uh, gastronomy, history, 
um, to have a kind of sort of scientific exploration of the territory. It's about learning about sustainable development issues and uh, at the end of the day to get some kind of inspiration and motivation from such an experience to, to make a change in, 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 in their own lives. So that's a very really kind of a, a very ambitious kind of, of vision for, for that. So you see from a very really well localized, uh, fantastic experience in the territory to, to a change in, in, in the world, but that's something we need. And this is the kind of ambition UNESCO and the MAP program have uh, when we promote that network of vice reserves. So I'm very pleased with these good examples from different parts of Europe, in different in Europe and different kinds of uh, uh, territories, um, from a floodplain, a river floodplain to mountains. So that's very, very, very interesting. So without losing more time, do you agree if I, I give further floors to, to Urska? Uh, she's uh, from uh, Dolina, she's from uh, Slovenia, she's the director of uh, an institute for development of local potential. And I, I know her since long working in different uh, projects, European projects, and dedicating herself uh, most of her life to the Amazon of Europe. So this river corridor flowing from uh, Austria down to the Danube and crossing Austria, Slovenia, Hungary, Croatia, and Serbia. So. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Urska, and uh, the floor is yours for the first presentation of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I would really <clears throat> like to thank the organizers for having the opportunity to present our work today. And I would like to warmly welcome all participants. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, uh, I am the manager of the tourism part in this Muradrava Denu Biosphere Reserve. And I would like to share with you what we've done in the last years and how we see the link. We are primarily focused for now on outdoor experiences, especially on cycling, but we see it really as a very important link also to, to enable the experience of different cultures because we cover five different countries. They share some common history. So it's really interesting to link them together again and of course, to give a new experience to all uh, visitors, which also affects the people who live in this area. So I will have a presentation and of course, I will be happy to answer also the questions afterwards. I will share my screen. Oops, this is not the one which is uh -huh, here. Can you see now the PowerPoint? Excellent, yeah, thank you. Okay. So let me start. As uh, it was mentioned before, we are talking about the five country UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, Muradrava Danube, and we call it Amazon of Europe. Why? Because it's uh, formed around these three beautiful mighty rivers, which kind of resemble also the Amazon area. And for the tourism purposes, we wanted to give it a catchy name. And once you discover this really untouched areas, in some parts, it's really like Amazon. And we created a development model to effectively engage all levels of stakeholders from these five countries to connect outdoor and cultural activities. So it's totally in line with the principles of the MAP program for nature and for the people. Uh, and we created, so there were a lot of activities in last 20 years for nature conservation. Uh, and this Amazon of Euro bike trail is the first development project in this area. So what we did, we created a five country tourism product. So our role also of our institute is to enable cooperation between all the countries and 11 included regions and to make sure it's one joint product. Because we know that small local activities, local tourism players, they have a difficult job to stand out and to become internationally known, but in this way we can make it easier. 
So we made one joint five country product. It's one destination. It's two cycling routes uh, al along these three rivers and it's connecting the five countries. And we also created a joint management model. It's still um, in progress to have a joint DMO and also the booking center. So just to remind you where this actually is, I'm sure you all know, but um, sometimes I present also to really like uh, overseas people and to show them that it's actually really between the capitals, Vienna, Zagreb, Budapest and Belgrade. Um, and these are the three rivers that we are talking about. And it's really beautiful nature. So it's actually a chain of 12 different protected areas which were then joined into one five country biosphere reserve, which was officially declared last year. So already that was a really long process. And as I mentioned, the Amazon of Europe bike trail is the first development project to do one joint outdoor tourism product. So shortly it's uh, one cycling trail with two routes. They both start in Austria and they go one on north and one on the south banks of the rivers and they both also finish in Hungary. So um, we plan that all our tourism products uh, join Austria, Slovenia, Hungary, Croatia and Serbia. So this is very important for us that we really make joint products and I'm sure you all have experience. It's sometimes difficult even to work with the neighboring municipality or region and with five countries. We have a lot of challenges, but we are not afraid of them. And this all started with, uh, well, it started before with different uh, participation processes. Uh, and then in 2018, we managed to get EU funding from the Interreg Danube Transnational Program with 15 partners from all these regions, so regions, municipalities, tourism boards, and protected areas. Uh, and we worked together for um, three and a half years to finalize this project. And now we have a follow-up project as well. So without EU funding, of course, it's difficult to do something like that. As a background, we really see the UNESCO and the MAP program, something that we strive to, to realize the objectives. So how to implement the sustainable tourism in all these areas, which brings also business opportunities to the locals. So we hope that one challenge is that a lot of people emigrated from these areas. These are really poor border areas. Uh, so we, we hope to bring really job opportunities to these people and also in this way to affect the territory. So one thing is to, uh, to preserve the, this beautiful nature and to give it the tourism potential but also to enable better life for people in this area. So our joint vision is that we become most well-known long distance bookable cycling trail in Europe. And we really want to offer responsible travel to discover these unique landscapes along the three rivers. So cyclists don't book websites, they book experiences and we want to combine everything into beautiful experiences. And what we did, we developed five pillars for sustainable development so that we make sure that once the project was over, we continue the work and together with this international product and brand, so you can see the, the logo, uh, we signposted the whole route. We created a joint destination development organization, uh, which also licensed the booking center. And last but not least, we have the Cycle for Nature program. So I will tell a bit about each of these points. And at the end of the day, we would like it to become a responsible green destination. 
So here are some photos, I'm sure, and I hope that you can also visit the area soon, especially now it's a bit easier. Of course, we had also a lot of difficulties in the last two years with several delays because of COVID. So where you can find out more, you have the website with all the information on aoebiketrail.com. We, you, there you can also get the cycling guide and the app for detailed route. Uh, the important part was to also signpost the whole route from Austria to Serbia and Hungary, as you could see. So you have the, this logo on all signs. They are different from country to country because they have to respect the national legislation. Uh, but these resting areas are similar in all countries so that everyone doesn't get lost. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's crucial to have the organization behind that will continue this work in the future. So these are the five pillars that I already mentioned and we have to ensure that all things continue. Uh, we are right now developing a joint strategy until 2030 uh, to have a clear goals, have clear goals what we want to achieve in the following years. And this destination development organization has a contract with the booking center. So it's one incoming tour operator based in Slovenia. Uh, which is one entry point for all clients, because we know that this is quite unknown area for most of Europe. And we wanted to ensure there is one entry point where someone can book the whole experience. So on the website, all information is available for someone who wants to come on their own. But if someone would prefer a bit more comfortable approach, then this is the address. We started last year with first explorer tour and also now we already have some cyclists on the road. So our season is from April till October and right now in May, it's really beautiful. Uh, and this is also the booking center a system behind. I don't want to go too much into detail, but um, we think this is really important that we have on one hand, all information available for everyone also on the route itself, but also the full service covered. And why this is important, because besides cycling in the following years, we plan to add also other outdoor and cultural experiences. Mm -hmm. A very important aspect is the Cycle for Nature program. It's a valorization program to support the wetlands and endangered species of the biosphere reserve, which means that for each booking, two euro per client per night goes to a special fund. And this fund will support different nature conservation projects. This was developed in cooperation with WWF, Austria and Adria, and also some protected areas um, Balaton Park and Danube Drava National Park. And we selected for now some smaller projects like um, nests for um, birds. Uh, and of course, with years, we hope also to have more funds for, for bigger conservation projects. So talking about the link between outdoor and also the territory and cultural experiences, we are this year developing um, what we call amazing moments. These are authentic cultural and gastronomic experiences where we want to have not just visiting some beautiful places, but also active engagement of participants. Like for a small group that they can really get to know the culture, the history, like pottery making, the bunkers in Hungary, jungle tour, cooking the local dishes and things like that. So this will be something that will really enrich also the outdoor experiences. So here are some nice photos also of the locations more culturally related. 
So we have also some beautiful towns, plenty of them actually, but of course I cannot tell you everything in this short time. Uh, really important tradition, the mills on the river, there are still about five, six of them, but in the past, of course, there were many. And this one is called Island of Love because it's actually uh, like a river um, side arm, so it's really an island. Um, and the Rudolf Steiner Center, so really the mastermind that come from this area, he started the Anthrosopoph Anthroposophy, um, Biodynamic Agriculture and Waldorf Schooling. So yeah, I'm sure you know his um, legacy. So um, coming to our team, we want to focus on one hand, of course, on sport, outdoor, like really how to have this personal achievement while spending time in nature, also to reconnect with oneself. Um, and of course, you cannot do that without also getting to know the history of these five countries. There was a lot of changes in the past. Um, and if you travel along the rivers, you also meet uh, different kind of uh, cultural places, different territories connect with local people, they are really hosp hospitable and for sure, at least some evenings, there will be some nice moments. So I think uh, it's a really good mix of uh, local people, also the service providers, because some of them are really not used to have people from Germany, from Belgium, from UK and so on. So it's a exchange also between the local people and the foreign people. So I think this is also very important, the role that we have like broadening the horizons. So we have a lot of plans for the future. As I mentioned, we work on new um, products on the joint strategy and especially we really want to work on increasing the quality. And last but not least, I would also like to mention that um, we really want to take care of the environment. Our vision is to be a climate neutral destination. We were just discussing which year to put as a milestone. We had 2030, I said it's too early. So we'll see how this will work out. Um, and we have two tools for that. One is so-called tourism impact model from Tourism 4.0 initiative. We have now pilots in 24 municipalities. So if you want to know more, um, you can check it online and you can also write to me. And we also started to develop the ecological footprint calculator because of course this travel still has some impact on the environment, especially the accommodations and the transfers. So we want to see what this is and in first step develop compensation scheme so that this fund will go again to cycle for nature program. And then in the following years to also become climate neutral at some point. So I would like to thank you for your attention and wrap up here, of course, hope to see you on the road. And uh, Yes, I'm here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oscar. That's really, really very interesting. Excellent presentation. Well done. And I think also very inspiring. I'm very happy to see the directions we're taking. And uh, probably, Anna, do you agree? We take some questions at the end of the three presentations. OK, so perhaps we could have kind of common question to the three of them instead of, because I'm sure that we would have a lot of, of details to ask about. And it's true that in a few minutes, it's very difficult to, to properly report on very interesting uh, experiences like, like that one. But um, definitely, it was very, very interesting. Thank you so much. So from the Amazon of Europe, we go to the Pyrene, uh, a bit southern in uh, Andorra. Mark phone and um, 
You see, I, I like very much that you, you have your name and then the name of the biosphere reserve. So you identify yourself very much with the biosphere reserve. Uh, Mark is uh, a researcher in um, a research um, institute uh, in, um, in Andorra. And uh, they are cooperating and working with the Ordino Biosphere Reserve in Andorra. Um, so Mark, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Philippe, and hello to everybody. Thank you to give us this opportunity and to share with all of you, but also to learn from you of all this experience and the lighting case studies. So just sharing, yeah. Good, Let's see if it works, yeah. So <clears throat> we are going to present you uh, just a, a short case study is a path to discover the roots and seeds of the Ordinos Biosphere Reserve. Just keep in mind the Ordinos Biosphere Reserve has only two years of life. It was declared on 2020. So uh, we are on the way of improving, learning and testing different uh, examples to improve our sustainability in all the dimensions. So in this case, we would like just to to put on the map uh, where is Andorra, because not everybody knows about our country. We live in between France and Spain in the middle of the Pyrenees Massif. And Andorra, in fact, it's a very, very little country, just uh, 458 kilometers square, in which live a total population of 18,000 uh, inhabitants, but we are a mountain country. Our average altitude, it's about 2,000 uh, meters. And the country is divided in seven different regions. Ordino, it's that one where we can see the logo of, of our uh, biosphere reserve. And um, let's see, in 2020, the UNESCO uh, recognized Ordino as, a, as the first national biosphere reserve and the second one of the whole Pyrenees mountains. So just to introduce you, how is our territory? Because this is, I think this is important to well understand, sorry, to well understand the coming contents. Um, Sorteng, it's our national park, which is included into the core area, of course. And in green, you can see all the buffer area. Uh, if you look, it's 72% of the territory. And this is because almost all the region belongs to public administration. We talk about mountains, we talk about alpine grasslands, and we talk about forests. So this biosphere, it's about forest and, and public mountains. And finally, the, our transition area, which is the almost the, 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 the less surface, it's uh, the red one, which includes also inside uh, a ski resort, the Ordinar Galis. Okay, so Sorteng, it's a, a little nat natural park with a high biodiversity uh, inside, a biodiversity hotspot with more than 800 species inside. Uh, 50 for uh, endemic Pyrenean species. It's part of the Ramsar, Ramsar site and also from the Emerald Network of the um, European Commission. And 35,000 visitors uh, comes to learn or to discover this uh, natural site per year. So we don't have time for this. You, 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 will, you will discover more information of our biosphere reserve on, on the website. It is available on four uh, language and we will be happy just to, to give you all the information you, you can need, okay? So we, today we are here just to, to present you the Rivera Amun uh, path which was established 
uh, during the last year. And it's an itinerary through Ordino Valley uh, along the main river, just to discover the landscape, the culture and the history of each of the eight towns or villages that uh, are established on the, on the land, as well as the traditional livelihood of the local community, communities that has coexisted in harmony or trying to coexist in harmony with natural resources and environment until today. So just for informing you, uh, Rivera Moon, uh, it means upstream path. This is because the, the natural path uh, goes along the river and try to explain to our visitors why the territory today is as it is. And the main objective is to promote sustainable and healthy tourism, to offer an holistic uh, cultural experience, to diversify the current um, touristic model, mainly concentrated on the core area and the ski resort. So we want, or the municipality wants to diversify this tourism and not being just concentrated on winter or in summer, in, in summer in a, in a single area. Also to give value, and we think this is very important, to give value to all the towns and villages and its communities because of its historical importance until the present, and to adapt this experience for almost all visitors. So we talk about an inclusive tourism adapted with Braille and Sings language. This path, this cultural and natural path uh, goes along 15 kilometers through a easy green path. As you can see, many, 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 many parts of this path are well adapted with uh, wood uh, barriers and so on. It can be done by walk, by, by bike, or even by free bus in order to minimize the the cars and the mobility into the biosphere reserve, okay? There is right now 25 interest well, points. I'm sorry, sorry. Um, I don't know if it's my problem only, but I, I always, I still see the same uh, slide. Uh, yeah, Is sorry. My problem only? In, in which slide are you? Uh, the upstream path, the first one presenting uh, Libera Munt. Ah. But is it the same for you, Oscar or uh, Thomas? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's an issue. Okay. Uh, I, I stopped to share and I, I reshare. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for this. It works now? No. Okay, now we don't see anything. So probably you reshare. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it works now? Now we see the screen as you see it. So with the two, so the anticipation on the right and the present slide on the left, but uh, at least we see something. Moving. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for this inconvenience. Let's try now. Okay. Okay. At least it's a different one. Yeah, at least. <laughs> and characteristics of. Uh... Yeah. So this is the main characteristics of the path uh, the long 25 interest points to discover our, our history and cultural. Uh, values. One free online audio guide. Uh, it can be downloaded by, with, by, by internet. There are many water uh, sources across the river, across the path, and of course many traditional uh, restaurants to, to taste our the mountain gastronomy or even to sleep there. Some short examples to show many interest points within that could be of interest. The traditional houses made with wood and local stones with some 
specific characteristics on the art architecture. Some different rock art examples that shows how the society has evolved along the time with the natural resources of the, of the biosphere reserve. Then the Romanesque heritage, uh, of course, this is uh, really important at the Pyrenees level, even in Catalonia has been declared as a wall heritage. Then the old and old iron mine, the iron industry was has a lot of importance many years ago because uh, it was iron of high quality and was produced almost all for uh, Catalonia or big cities such as Barcelona. Also talking or discovering the, the hard work of shepherds of uh, alpine areas or even um, in, um, going at the high mountain level to, to, to see beautiful landscapes and to understand how people, local people had to live on this uh, extreme and difficult uh, environment. But this is not, this, this is just culture. This is uh, just many values and we want to go further and improving the experience. To do so, what we are trying to implement, it's to involve uh, local people and giving them many course, courses, training course, just to, to have biosphere uh, reserve informers. These uh, actors are working to provide on-site support to visitors, to promote sustainable use of the territory, to share extra information on the biosphere reserve values. And I think this is really important to co-responsibility the users with our environment and with our communities. The main goal is not only to show what we have or what we are, but also to involve them in maintaining all these values because we think they are part of the solution and not only of the problem. And we want them to, to really uh, understand the need on conserving, on improving, but also on testing different approaches when we are talking of sustainability. So these, um, these informers, uh, they work basic, basically on six key points. This is trying to reduce the ecological footprint of our, of our visitors, um, trying, they don't leave trace when visiting the, the, the territory, to take care of the wildlife, to respect the private property, uh, to be considerate with other visitors, and of course, learning and taking an active part of the biosphere reserve, okay? Then we have also La Casa La Montaña, it's a mountain living lab, and we use these facilities to improve the transition for a digital tourism. And this space uh, just offer additional contents. It is placed at the beginning of the path, just uh, in front of the, the post uh, tourism office. And the main goal is to offer additional contents uh, for our visitors in order to help them to plan these uh, day journeys and also to transfer more awareness and contents for being more sustainable. Some examples of these contents, uh, don't hear you have, no? For example, uh, the, com the commitment section, you can get many different information for doing free camping, to flight drones, uh, when and how and Mark, we have, we have lost you can, your presentation uh, again i'm sorry night a fire etc also you can know our guides to contract them discover our gastronomy or where i can get sleep uh, do you have more ecologic campings on the zone all these kind of information are inside these contents and finally we try to use uh, new technologies 
to improve the experience. Mark, sorry uh, to interrupt you. We have lost your presentation again for the special last. Special attention on these oh. visitors with many uh, disabilities, maybe persons in, in well uh, seats or um, all persons, all people. Okay, so we use virtual reality to transport them on different uh, points of the ballet. And they, in this way, they can experience also the values and the beauties of the Biosphere Reserve. And another thing, and we are really, really proud you of this. Hear me. Uh, Sorry, study, Do you hear me? Escape room sessions. A young uh, girl, which is guide, mountain guide of Ordino, has, uh, has off it, it, it is offering uh, escape room sessions based on cultural and traditional elements of the of the biosphere reserve. In this sense, for example, uh, you can experience by yourself um, the the life of um, iron um, iron mine worker through the different clues and 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 puzzles you you must find and search across a, for, for in in this case on the borders of the of the iron mine okay and finally we are this is not ready but we are hard working on this initiative because we we think that it's it's really important and it's the labels for for products and service produced inside the biosphere reserve and in such we want to offer to our visitors, uh, local products, but also to promote the, the shepherds or the artisanats to, to produce in a more sustainable ways, giving like this, giving more value to these, to, to these products. And this is all, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I don't know, we have a problem, you don't hear me. And um, we have a, again problem with your presentation for the last uh, four or five slides. So your speech was very clear, but we've missed the illustration. So if the organizer agree, we would like to ask you, and by the way, ask the three of you, if we, you are okay with the idea of sharing your presentation. So at least we could enjoy what we have not seen, uh, the, the very few last slides of your presentation. But thank you very much. That was really, again, very, very interesting and very inspiring. And uh, I see some commonalities also among the two we have seen so far. That's really interesting. Before introducing the third and last speaker of this afternoon, uh, let me say to the participants that there's a, an opportunity for you to uh, raise questions make comments on the question and, and, and uh, answer the uh, uh, chat of, the, of this webinar. Um, if you want to intervene, it's a bit more complicated to, to arrange because you should be authorized by the organizer, convener of the webinar to uh, then uh, appear among the, the presenters, raise questions or show your video. So, um, our preference would be that you really use the question and answer um, a section of the webinar to uh, raise your questions, and we will take them at the end of the three presentation for uh, starting our debate. So we are coming to the, the, the third presentation. Thank you again, uh, Mark, Thomas, um, Biri. You are uh, from the Christianstad uh, University in Sweden. And of course, your university, you 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 um, a researcher there, and you work very much um, in relationship with the uh, vice reserve in um, um, Latin America. And um, that's a place I've never visited. I had the chance to see, of course, the Amazon of Europe and Andorra in the Pyrenees. That's a, a place I've never visited. So I'm very curious to see what you have to present, and I'm sure you will. Like the other two, make a presentation that uh, it's, that's a real invitation to come and visit, and you will tell us more about your uh, experience there related to outdoor tourism and going further. 
So, uh, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. I just want to make sure, do you hear me okay? And do you see my slide? For the moment, yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let me know if we have it, if we have a problem. So thank you for um, allowing me to be involved in this really interesting uh, event. And I want to thank my fellow presenters. Um, now I have, you know, two additional sites I need to uh, explore um, as I travel south. Uh, but right now I'm going to take you to the Kushansa Vatarike. And in some ways, I think um, my pictures might look a little bit like our first presentation, like the Amazon of Europe, uh, that uh, the feature here is indeed water. In Swedish, the word Vatarike um, actually means water kingdom or, or water riches. Um, and so the emphasis here in the name of the biosphere reserve is indeed on the, the, the wonder of water. All right, the Krishansa Vataniki, as you, you can sort of get a sense of from this picture, it has expansive wetlands. And those expansive wetlands are home to um, home and refuge to uh, a multitude of, of species, migrating birds, for example, uh, fish species in the Helgi River, etc. So it, it's its richness is in part very much very very uh, attributed to the wetlands. Um, so I'm going to take you into the wetlands today. All right. So I apologize, this map is not very good, but um, on the on the upper left of my screen, you see that long skinny uh, map of Sweden. And in black you can see the outline of Kushansta the the municipality so we're very far in the south of Sweden in a part of Sweden called Skåne and um, and then the municipality again is Kristianstad interesting to note because this was once a part of Denmark that Kristianstad is actually named for a Danish king all right who founded the city over 400 years ago so it has an interesting history that is both Swedish and Danish all right Here's another view looking towards the sea. It's a little hazy in the photo, but um, the Helgi River in the foreground uh, makes its way here all the way, or not so far, just uh, uh, 20 kilometers to the Baltic Sea. Just a little information about this place. As I mentioned, it's the Helgio uh, River lo uh, lower watershed. It's uh, over 100 hectares in size. And when I refer to that, I mean the biosphere reserve is over 100 or 100,000 hectares. Um, and, but it, it closely matches the Krishansta municipality. And there's beautiful collaboration between the municipality and the biosphere reserve. There are approximately 85,000 uh, residents. So if I got that right, if I understood Mark right, there are about the same number of people that live in Kishansa that live in Andorra. Um, and 21,000 visitor sites and one main visitor center. And I'm going to talk more about those places in just a minute. All right. I know you folks know this, this, this idea that biosphere reserves are places that are to bring together conservation of biodiversity and cultural diversity you know, really bring them together um, via partnerships between people and nature. And I hope that what I briefly share with you highlights this idea, all right, that, um, that opportunities for people to experience the Krishan Savatanike are very intricately linked to the nature conservation or the biodiversity conservation that is at the the core of the mission of the Kushansta Vatanike. All right, and all of you that work in biosphere reserves know that conservation and sustainable development and support, these three pieces really are, um, uh, make up the mission of biosphere reserves, that, that uh, biodiversity, and human opportunity go hand in hand and education and research support uh, bringing these things together. 
And I want to take us today right to the middle of that. Now this blue circle I put in the middle, outdoor recreation in Krishansta, all right? And, 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 and so this quote here, the best way to learn and understand landscape values is achieved by providing experience and knowledge in place. That's a quote from the Krishansta Vatanike, you know, part of their mission. And what I like about this is there's this emphasis that like on both experience, but getting people out into the places that getting to know the place of the Vatanike through, you know, hands-on experience. And so I'm going to focus a little, tell you a few stories of how this is done, you know, how the Krishansa Vatanike tries to engage both residents and visitors in this amazing place, all right, through the experiences that they facilitate. So first off, I'm gonna go back to this slide that I showed a moment ago. And I've circled in red that there are 21 designated visitor sites and one main visitor center. And that's what's on this next map. So let me jump to this next map. So here you have a map of the Krishansa Vatanike Biosphere Reserve. And all these red dots are the visitor sites. And if you went to any one of these, you'd think, oh, I'm in a beautiful park. Because really, they look like, feel like, act like parks. Some of them are very small, and some of them are really quite expansive. So, and, and what's unique about these parks or sites um, is they attempt to feature some of the bio biodiversity and cultural diversity that make this area so interesting. So they have been selected because all of these places have a special part of the story to tell. And I'm gonna take you to a few of these to show how the Krishan Savatanik uses recreation and experiences in these places. All right, so the first one I want to take you to, if you look right in the middle of um, this map, oh goodness, I haven't even labeled it on this map. <laughs> if you see the word in the middle though that says Canal Husit, or right above Krishansta, right, right there is the first place I want to take you, okay? And the reason it's not marked on this map is because it's sort of a, a special visitor site. It's the Natur Room, all right? So all of the sites are actually places, like I describe them as parks. The Natur Room is actually a building. It's a visitor center. And this visitor center um, is designed as sort of a, you could say a, uh, a welcome site for the for all of the Vatanike, a visitor site, a central location where you know you can gain a lot of good information about the entire Vatanike. It's called Naturum here, which you know quickly translated as nature room uh, in Swedish. And that is actually a designation that you find all over Sweden. There's 38 Naturums in Sweden. And that designation comes from the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. And so, you know, and, and some of those are found in national parks or other interesting places in Sweden. Krishansta Vatanike has a natur room to feature the biosphere reserve and the stories and places of the biosphere reserve. Now, let me just, yeah, so, uh, the, the Swedish EPA describes this Naturum idea with a strong emphasis on the idea that these facilities are, are gateways, all right? They're gateways to nature and to culture. And, and so consider this passage that I took out of the Naturum handbook, all right? 
Uh, Naturum shows the way out into nature. Visitors will gain knowledge, understanding, and a feel for the value of nature, as well as be inspired to get out, take time, and gain a deepened nature contact. And I, I love that, that this idea that here's a, a building where people go indoors, and the goal of that indoor building is to get people back out the door. And that, that truly is the function here. So you step into the nature room and hopefully you leave it very soon after with ideas of places that you need to go to, places you, you should see or uh, places you now want to experience. I am a researcher. And so a few years ago, a colleague and I said, huh, I wonder if that works. We, lit, we, we set up a research study where we talked to visitors visiting the Naturum about their behavior, you know, their inspiration or their motivation after visiting the Naturum. And I'm, I am happy to report that what we found was a, a pretty strong link between the kind of experience they received in this place, in this building, that motivated very specific outdoor activity. So you can read more about that. I have a reference for you if you if that sounds interesting. Let me take you outside though, okay? I'm just going to take you to a few of these visitor sites. And um, just to give you a feel both for the Krishansa Vatanike biosphere area, but also um, to, I haven't really talked much about outdoor recreation and I want to because one method that the Biosphere Reserve uses is to make sure that every visitor site has opportunity for people to engage. Now, sometimes that opportunity, or always that opportunity is interpretation. There's signage, there's information. So that's one way we engage. We engage through information. But most of these sites, like this one, Balls Berriet, has picnic tables, you know, so opportunities for picnicking, hiking trails, biking trails, et cetera. So this is an example of, of one of the sites. It's, um, Krishansa Vatanik is very low. We're basically at sea level. In fact, parts of Krishansa Vatanik are below sea level. But Balls Barriet is our high point. It's up on a high hill and it's this lovely expansive beach forest. So highlighting a very unique habitat type. All right. So you come here to hike, you come here to ride your bike, you come here to pick mushrooms at the right time of the year. Or if you're there right now at this time of the year, there's just a green haze over your head as all those beach buds are beginning to explode. It's fantastic, it's beautiful. Espit is um, a site where the Helgi O, the river, the Helgi River, empties into the Baltic Sea. And it's, it's known, um, you come to Espit to look at birds, to bird watch. There's a, and, and many of the sites in the Krishansa Valtonike have bird towers, bird observation towers to facilitate that form of outdoor recreation. Folks come from all over Europe well, really all over the world to observe migrating birds mo that move through these wetlands in Krishansta. Of course, you can see, you might also be attracted by the Baltic Sea to swim or to hike or to experience this place uh, another way. All right, so that's Espit. Degeberia Becca is uh, another site and one of, another one of our visitor sites. One of the interesting things here from a biodiversity standpoint, are some of the sandy soil uh, habitat uh, um, features, such as a small lizard and certain plant species that, that are unique to this area. But there's also a cultural historical element to Degeberia Becca having to do with farming uh, in this region. So, um, I want to make sure that I don't just focus on the natural wonder that there's all kinds of cultural heritage that is wrapped into these visitor sites. I don't have a picture of the visitor site that's literally right smack in the like 
sort of the most populated part of Krishansta, but there is a site called Kanal Husit, and the focus there is indeed on how is it that a city was built in a swamp. And I'll save that history for any of you to come visit or follow up and ask me. But it's a really interesting story why a city would have been built in such a wetland. All right. And hint, it has to do with warring kings uh, 400 and some years ago. But anyhow, let me take you to one or two more quick, quickly, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, two more of these visitor sites. One is called Polkin. And Polkin just had its peak of the year because Polkin is known for the thousands and thousands of migrating cranes that come from further south in Europe, you know, really from Northern Africa and across Europe and make their way into the Nordic countries, and spread out. But as they're migrating, there's often thousands that end up in Krishansta and need a break as they are traveling so far. So here the attraction is to see this wildlife and to see it in such phenomenal numbers. And so it attracts, again, folks from all over the world that want to experience thousands and thousands of migrating cranes. Usually the high point um, is about 8,000 cr uh, cranes a day, um, you know, when, at the peak, um, but um, yeah. So uh, Pulkin, and one last site I wanted to show you is Framzon. And this is a lovely um, uh, uh, river system, that, or it's a tributary to the Helgio. And so this site um, offers not only some of the other typical recreation I've already mentioned, like hiking or, or biking, but also fishing, all right? And, um, you know, fishing uh, is, sport fishing is a real attraction at many of the visitor sites because of this, you know, interesting diversity of fish species and a real interest in fishing as a recreation option um, in Sweden. So, that's a snapshot of, of you know, just four of, of 21 of these visitor sites. And like I said, each one tells a different story and they tell a different story in part by the experience you can have engaging in recreation in these places. If you're interested, um, you know, and I want to highlight that I want to remind you that I am not a, uh, I don't work for the Biosphere Reserve. I'm just a, you know, a interested uh, member of the community and a research partner. And so here's some of the research, for example, we've looked at outdoor recreation and place attachment in the Biosphere Reserve. We've looked at the role of the Nature Center and how it fits with what they're trying to do. And more recently, we've looked at how um, COVID-19 outdoor recreation management fit together in the context of this region. So just a, a quick snapshot of some of the social science research that is going on in our area. And I'll end with that. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Thomas, and thank you to the three of you. Uh, we have still about half an hour of time to have a discussion, a debate among us and, and with the participants and uh, followers of this webinar. And I would have myself plenty of questions to raise, but we will see in the course of the debate. For sure, you are uh, fantastic ambassadors of your places and you have made a really beautiful and excellent presentations. They are in fact, an invitation to visit, an invitation to, to discuss. So we are losing more time for the moment. I'd like to ask the organizer if we have some questions in the q um, section or chat or directly in the chat, so. Not yet. I was writing that any, um, 
questions or uh, uh, deepening is uh, welcome. So feel, please feel free to write it down or to uh, raise your hand uh, so that I can open the microphone. So if you allow me in to start with <laughs> Uh, a question. So I would like to go directly to a point which is of great interest to to UNESCO and the MAP program because you are three of you part of Vice Reserve and develop these experiences in, in Vice Reserve. So um, I would say there's nothing. Well, what's the added value for you of being a, a Vice Reserve and um, in particular in developing these experiences? But also, how do you see there could be even more added value as being part of, of, of a network? Because the three of you have very well highlighted the fact, even that locally, like in Sweden, uh, you can have different visitor centers. This is all about networking. The, the, the principle of your main nature uh, visitor center is not unique for the Vice Reserve, it's part of something national. Of course, those guys has showed us. How to work with five countries, five vice reserve, making a transboundary by one. And Andorra is so small that uh, we saw having a, a strategy in the context of the Pyrenees and Andalusia is, is difficult to, to imagine. So uh, that's my uh, hope also that the MAP program, the World Network of Vice Reserve, makes, makes a difference or could make a difference. So it's a question uh, raised to you. I like very much the, the idea of the cranes migrating. So they connect sites to site, and 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 the same way visitor uh, could be one day in the southern part of Europe and visiting uh, the Reno uh, Vice Reserve, then going north and, and and visiting the Amazon of Europe, and finally crossing the Baltic Sea and arrive to Sweden. So what sh should the crane visitors, the tourists find, and uh, which is perceive as special because this is a vice reserve and of course we have showed all the attention to sustainable tourism and similar things but there could be something more so that's my question to the three of you to start the discussion well i'm happy to jump in because you you mentioned cranes so if that's okay with my colleagues i'll i'll get us started here but one of the things that is so unique about being you know, being a partner with a biosphere reserve is that that um, biosphere reserves have they take on that role model responsibility. You know, there's an effort to model potential sustainable develop sustainable transformation, and and um, and that's so exciting then to have that laboratory. You know, that we're a part of, and so let me just tell you about the cranes just a little bit more. Um, I didn't have a lot of time, so I focused on the human experience of these amazing animals and, you know, and witnessing a migration. But what was also missing from that story was farmers in the region for a long time had had an incredible trouble with the cranes and other migrating geese and whatnot, because their migration coincided with, the, with a lot of the early planting. So, here we have conflict and wildlife human conflict is a problem we see all over Europe, all over the world. How do we solve those conflicts on behalf of, of nature and behalf of, of, of people? And so one of the ideas was, you know, and this was, well, I say ideas, it was the Biosphere Reserve, it was farmers, it was local birders, it was local residents that said, okay, let's feed the cranes in certain places and, and attract them to keep them out of farmers' fields, but all, and they're moving through this area anyway. They need the nourishment, so let's give them what they need as they continue north, and in a sense protect them, protect the farmers. And what it did was it opened the door. Oh, now we have these sites where people want to come and see them. They're you know, and and so it it sort of it, it fit together. This conflict resolution fit together, and I don't think this would have happened as easily outside of a biosphere reserve. All these relationships and all these pieces were in place. So I'll stop there, so my colleagues can give their examples or talk about other aspects of this question. 
No, thank you. That's a very clear indication of some let's say, added value advantages you see of being a bus racer. Murska, Mark, uh, you have something? Yes, to uh, thank you so much. I'm really inspired also to visit these beautiful places across Europe. Uh, the biosphere reserve at five level country has a huge added value for us. One thing is to give us the opportunity to really work in this huge area. It's one million hectares. So one thing is between the countries to enable cooperation in tourism. Also, like you mentioned, in other areas, in nature conservation, in fishery, in hunting, in forestry and so on. Uh, but also to work with other biosphere reserves like uh, at Euromab, uh, conferences and so on. We, we also were thinking perhaps to organize the youth forum in one of the following years. And please we had do. one- Please do, please do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we will contact you for more. Uh, we had one idea to develop a passport that someone who would cycle would have, you know, a stamp at the end of each stage. And maybe we could have a passport of all biosphere reserves. I think that would be a great idea. So um, a lot of ideas for the future. And like Thomas said, we have also the fish, the sturgeon that for example is born and at the starting part of Mura river and then it um, goes all along to the Danube and then it always comes back to where it was born. So it was a really a good sign of like, uh, you know, how nature is connected regardless of the borders. Mm -hmm. Mark? Yeah, <laughs> in our case, I would like to well, thanks again and excuse me for these technical issues. No problem. Uh, okay, and in fact, Andorra, even if, if, if Ordino is already a biosphere reserve, nowadays we are working on a new candidacy at national level. So, this is because we political, but also economical uh, actors have well understand that uh, it's not as a problem, a local problem. It's, we face a big challenge as, as humanity and we need to go further. And we think that if we are able to be the first country as a biosphere reserve, it could be inspiring for other little countries around the world. And the, the, the main goal to be more sustainable or, or growing in harmony with natural resources could be maybe more close than now. Oh yeah, excellent. The, the model also inspiring really sustainable policies. Uh, I come back to you with, uh, because you have used these animals, um, uh, migratory birds could be even uh, seen and felt as a problem, as a source of conflict. So I was thinking about the visitors, tourists as migrants, <laughs> migratory species invading your places. So um, uh, Urska and Mark, you were very clear about the fact and I was very impressed by the fact that you you mentioned ecological footprint calculator for carbon footprint. So you are developing even tools to uh, hopefully reduce and, and manage this kind of impact. And, and finally engage together local community operators and visitors for uh, higher sustainability. Uh, um, and that, that's really, really interesting. So I would like to stimulate you now uh, to comment a bit more on, on that. So in fact, from a potential conflicts, uh, it's just a bit going beyond the calculation of carrying capacity or, or those things when you plan uh, tourist activity, but what you really do to make them less impacting or uh, from an environmental point of view, for example, but uh, more impacting in terms of uh, benefits to the local uh, community and the local nature. So uh, a second round among you, short responses, but uh, I think it's very important you develop that a little bit. Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, 
to uh, the, yeah well, okay. maybe i can start <laughs> so yeah we have a lot of plans and it's more in the starting phase i would say even though some projects are already ongoing in terms of river restoration opening the side arms uh planting the trees and so on but maybe on more limited basis um yeah like you said we see we see big differences between countries for example from austria to serbia of course austria is more advanced in this regard and we want to share those practices and first raise awareness because for example when we come to accommodations to hotels some already know that something should be done in this direction. They take care about how much energy they consume to save water and so on, to recycle and to try to reduce waste generation. There are a lot of initiatives to have a zero waste events, for example, uh, but in some parts it's really at, at starting point. So we see we need to start with awareness raising, education, why is this beneficial that also the accommodations will save some costs on this uh, regard? And it's a big work. So it starts with this awareness raising activities and trying to show what are the benefits. And then on the long term, we can see the impact. And yeah, we see a good link that then um, we start also, we know of course, transportation cannot be changed from today to tomorrow. We work also not so directly, but we, when we talk to municipalities, to regional authorities, that they work on public transport to have more train connections, to have buses which can transfer the bikes from one point to another and so on. Mm -hmm. So these are some activities that we do. And yeah, we know a lot of work is in front of us. And also EU has really um, emphasis on this with the Green Deal. And we hope to have also more projects in this regard. That's clear. Nice visions need concrete tools and, and application. Mark, about that? Yeah. Um, as far as we know, uh, we are working on that. We did not too much time to, to improve mm -hmm. our advances, but um, now we are developing this uh, phase of communication. We need all population understanding well what the, a biosphere reserve is, what is the purpose, and how they can uh, get involved in an active way. Not only saying, I, I live in a biosphere reserve. No. I'm proud to live in a biosphere reserve because on my day, I do this, I can do that, and I can help with this, no? So we are just now working on, on this engagement with uh, citizens, but also with enterprises. Um, let's see in the future, but the, the willing is, is here. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. I. Um, First off, I, I, I want to mention, I want to pick up on something Ushka talked about, you know, awareness raising and, and something that's, um, it may not be unique, but it certainly is a strong point that the Kishan Sabatnaniki has is its outreach to, uh, to uh, its educational outreach. So there is a team of educators and they work with school groups and they work with public groups, but literally thousands of people a year and with in very specific ways trying to, for example, curriculum on ecosystem services. And, and, and there, there's been a real effort, um, educational effort. How do we communicate the value of wetlands? Because in Sweden and much of the Western world, um, you know, there's this history of abusing wetlands, filling wetlands in, you know, not appreciating the value of wetlands. And so really, you know, at the, you could say that's at the core of how the Kushansa Vatraniki even started, that people started to reclaim wetlands as beautiful and wetlands is important. But that education work then continues and it continues in, in various directions. So I, I really want to emphasize educational outreach. But 
one other sustainability related effort and um and there's a number of examples of this, but there are researchers at my university in the gastrono gastrono gastronomy program at food science and, and um, researchers at, uh, or at, with the Vatanike that have teamed up to try to figure out, are there interesting ways to prepare the fish species Brax? It's not a fish that the public really eat around here, but there's an overabundance in some of the waterways creating some ecological challenges. So is one of the sustainable solutions that we eat more of the fish that are right outside our door. And, and so it's an interesting investigation in how do you change sort of, uh, culinary customs for eco ecological benefit. Uh, so that, mm -hmm. that's an interesting sustainability story that's just unfolding now. Oh, no, that's definitely <laughs> really interesting. Yeah, I've heard about uh, an island in Japan where they've to encourage hunting because they have uh, an excess of particular species and people don't, don't hunt anymore in Japan, for example. So the, the story is back to origin. Um, since you were mentioning gastronomy, uh, I'd like to uh, stimulate now our debate in the direction of linking, let's say, the uh, nature attractiveness towards more cultural attractiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, you have three of you mentioned that uh, in your presentation, but uh, just to understand a bit more, hit the entry point for uh, making a, a, a tourism experience, outdoor experience in your territories is definitely landscapes, nature, and of course, all the facilities you offer to experience that. Uh, how do you uh, then lead the, the, the customers, the visitors uh, uh, towards a, a wider experience, a wider discovery of the territory, also touching uh, upon gastronomy, cultural history, as we've seen, and um, it's a kind of a strategy we need to, to, to develop and apply. And I think it's also a question the organizers of the women have raised, uh, am I right, uh, Anna, that, um, so how, how do you concretely organize and realize that um, we need strategies, we need again, mm -hmm. concrete tools and activities to, to move in, in that direction, because as you just said, food is very much related to a territory. Of course, the history, the way you build, and the way you practice art and all this are very strictly uh, interconnected. So um, I would like to ask Mark first to, to respond. So I'm just changing the order of yeah. the events every time. Uh, so in, in Ordino, we don't have a specific traditional gastronomy. I mean, our gastronomy, it's very close to the Catalan one, okay? So from the Catalonia. But uh, these typical plates that in some cases are, are in, in danger or even lost from the, the receipts, we have done a lot of work to, to, to recollect them. And now uh, we use the Mountain Living Lab of Ordino in order to perform and to spread all this uh, gastronomy culture, not only to the citizens, but also to the visitors and in which little place they can um, they can command or they can ask for these uh, plates I, yeah, please yeah I have an interesting example from Kishansta um, that because um, well a, a real interesting part of the history of this area was the culture of you know of, of um, fishermen, uh, fishing villages and fishing families on the Baltic. And one of the key species that, you know, many of these fishing families were harvesting was eel. And there's a long tradition of eel, for example. Migratory, migratory species again. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and uh, um, you know, if the traditional Scone Christmas features smoked eel and and there's these lovely cottages and you know and there's a whole sort of physical presence of this fishing heritage up and down the coast of this area but 
eel are terribly endangered. Their population numbers have crashed and, you know, in part due to some ecological challenges in the Baltic. So how do you reconcile celebrating this cultural heritage and enjoying this cultural heritage when we have a, a population in rapid decline? And that's a, a question that the Vatanrike has worked closely with, how we honor that history, how we make sure that that history, you know, is a an important part or, you know, is noted as an important part of this region with in hand in hand with and what are our concerns for the future. And so and it even comes down to, you know, events where people get to taste smoked eel, um, but in a very moderate, mm -hmm. controlled way in that the idea is we need to uh, really uh, manage our consumption as a part of helping this species um, towards recovery. But that, so that's an interesting story of trying to take local cuisine and couple it with biodiversity issues and, um, and kind of honor both efforts. An excellent example, uh, Yuska. Yeah, along Mura, Drava, and Danube, it's also a very rich tradition of fishing, mm -hmm. but also hunting and different kind of meat dishes. And it's really popular to eat like plates of meat. So also our cyclists complain that they get too much food actually. Um, and there are a lot of traditional recipes. It's interesting that some dishes are similar or almost the same in all countries like probably you know goulash from Hungary or some kind of fish stew fish paprikash and apple strudel like some kind of different pies and cakes it's also a rich tradition of wine making and spirits like palinka or schnapps I'm sure you are all familiar with and you cannot almost escape that if you are in this region um, so yeah, it's uh, also part of our offer to combine cycling or hiking with workshops where um, people can learn how to do this. They can be part of a cooking class or sweet making class. So I think it's a really cru crucial part also as part of hospitality to, to do some things together and also to taste good things together. Definitely, gastronomy, we, we play easy with that to attract people and, and their interest. Do you see an interest to go beyond that and, and discover uh, history, monuments, art, and, and so on? So uh, is it, I know it's part of your offer, but so do you see this is uh, an attraction to the customers or, or visitors? Yes, definitely. Uh, like you mentioned, it's also part of history of songs and all kind of uh, like religion, um, festivals, a lot of different kind of food festivals. Um, and so also, for example, there is one village in Croatia, Hlebine, it's very famous, not directly gastronomy, but the Easter eggs, which are painted in naive art. So it's a special uh, painting technique, which takes more several weeks to paint one uh, painting or like uh, Easter egg. So it's definitely, um, it cannot be separated from culture. And maybe also one challenge that I would mention also for sporty people, but generally today, we have a lot of special requests like vegans, vegetarians, gluten-free, and so on. And it's mm. sometimes also challenging to, to um, educate all the service providers what this is about. So it's also one part of our activities. Yeah. We have time for asking a, a last question, right, Anna? And, and fortunately, it comes from the audience now. And I think it's interesting because it touches upon something you just uh, uh, mentioned in your, your presentation, Thomas, in your response uh, about processes and how we cooperate and we establish relationships and vice versa make a difference as platforms to facilitate that. So the question is, since it's crucial for the private and the public sector to work together, 
to go ahead with these uh, development programs you, you have very well illustrated. Which are the major challenges for this type of cooperation you have experienced during your specific tourism development programs and experiences as a vice freezer? So uh, to make the private and the public sector work together. Maybe I can continue. Uh, in our part, mostly we have good experience. I would say sometimes we have to start on common understanding because the business part would like quick results and these things take more time, of course, to develop. So it's much easier, for example, when we started with the booking system and they got some clients, then it was also easier to work with private sector private sector, they don't have time to join so many educational workshops and uh, such activities. So maybe this is also a problem because especially if there are smaller like bed and breakfast or like smaller attractions or family businesses, they really don't have the time and the capacity to, to be the whole day on a workshop, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're quite interested to do some study tours to see how things are done in other parts and to, to participate. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas, your microphone is on. So, Yeah, I, you know, um, I, I don't want to be uh, a, a Pollyanna and just say all the happy, nice things. But, you know, what I really... I think because there are real environmental challenges here in Kushan said that are that are not, you know, the 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 problems haven't been solved. Um, and so, you know, maybe the big some of those larger environmental issues that are hotly debated, that, that's a big challenge. And what the Vatanrike has chosen is they look for partners that want that that buy in and that want to work together and so i could say one of the problems is we still have these problems we haven't dealt with but it's partly because the path that the the vatonik has chosen let's take participants that are that are willing to give this a go and focus our energies there and and not surprising they're quite successful because they get the you know collaborators that are willing to take risks and willing to you know listen to one another. That said, you know uh, how do we then crack some of these other you know issues um, in our region um, that are a little more controversial? Uh, certain agricultural practices, for example, and and those haven't been fully addressed here. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mark? Totally agree with Thomas. It's very difficult. It's very difficult because uh, enterprise, the first question they ask you is uh, how I can take profit of this and how I can continue to be uh, competitive uh, related to others' business that are outside the bioservice. And so a lot of times you don't have a clear uh, answer to this question. So I think the, the key point is to look for this motivate actor and start with them. And then they can show to other colleagues how to do it or just because he's doing this, the others will do also this. Mm -hmm. And there is not a clear science or we don't have clear experience on this, but we think we, are, we will do in this way. Thank you so much. Uh, I go then to Anna. Are you happy with what we have done so far, or do you want us to continue? <laughs> it's uh, very inspiring what you share with your presentation, with your work. So uh, thank you so much to be here and to uh, share it with all of us. I hope it will be inspiring for all the territories uh, still uh, watching this webinar. We should continue for yeah. hours, I think, but I, 
or even longer, I would like to close with a kind of very uh, a proposal, kind of proposal, yeah. Uh, in the forthcoming Council of the MAP program, we will discuss one of the points and discussion will be a thematic network. Thematic network, so we have regional networks, we have ecosystem uh, oriented uh, networks like the mountain, uh, vice versa network. Um, I think what you have just uh, started to elaborate together this afternoon is a good demonstration that we definitely would need a, a thematic network dedicated to outdoor tourism and as you have described it as an entry point to many things and so looking really at what makes it a bit special in the MAP program in the network of vice reserve and what we could do together so we have just clearly demonstrated the interest of exchanging presenting experiences but then elaborating a bit more on, on that. So the lessons learned and, and, and uh, at the end of the day, some kind of advice or uh, experience we could share with many other to, to make a big change in, in every part of the world. So that's a little bit my dream that uh, very soon we could be in contact again and, and, and with others and, and, and further develop a debate and a reflection on, on, on this very, very important uh, uh, aspect of advice uh, reserve related to tourism and adult tourism in particular. So that was very useful uh, to me. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for, for that. So yeah, thank, thank you, you thank you all. Thank Thanks to all of you. Uh, and we hope it will be a discussion that will continue in the next month. Uh, I just remember tomorrow uh, there's another contribution and the theme will be on uh, how um, outdoor disciplines must be managed in order to respect and guarantee carrying capacity of an area. So sustainability through conservation, but also uh, respect for the area uh, we are in. So uh, maybe it will be another little piece of this puzzle we are uh, building. So thank you uh, again for being here and for your contribution. See you next month and uh, in next occasion. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so before. much. Bye. Goodbye and see you soon, hopefully, at your place. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye.